Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at the numerical approaches we can use for solving elliptic partial differential equations. The canonical elliptic PDE is the Poisson equation, and in one dimension, for an interval from A to B, the Poisson equation is simply minus u double prime of x is equal to f of x, where f of x is a given function, and we would have boundary conditions at x equal a and x equal b. And we've already seen this problem. This is the two-point boundary value problem that we considered previously. And recall that elliptic PDEs model steady state behavior, and therefore there is no time derivative. So in order to make this into a PDE, we would need to consider more than one spatial dimension. So let's define omega to be a two-dimensional domain, and then the Poisson equation for our solution u of x and y in this domain will satisfy uxx plus uiy is equal to a function f of x and y. And we could write that more succinctly as just the Laplacian of u is equal to f. And again, we'll need to impose boundary conditions, either Dirichlet, Neumann, or Robin, on d omega that is defined as the boundary of omega. So we'll consider how to use a finite difference scheme to approximate the 2D Poisson equation. So first we'll introduce a uniform grid to discretize omega. So let's define h to be equal to the grid spacing delta x and delta y, and we'll just take these two spacings to be equal. Then we'll define xi to be i times h, to be the position of the ith x-coordinate. We'll define yj to be j times h, and we'll define capital U of i and j to be our approximation to our solution evaluated at xi and yj. So therefore we need to be able to approximate the derivatives uxx and uiy on our finite difference grid. And a natural idea is to make use of a central difference method. So at a grid point xi and yj, we have that uxx is equal to u of xi minus 1 comma yj minus 2 uxi comma yj plus uxi plus 1 comma yj divided by h squared plus terms of order h squared. And we have a similar expression for uyy. And we can combine these two expressions into an expression for the Laplacian of u at xi and yj. And we'll actually note that the central term in these two expressions combines and we get a term minus 4 u of xi and yj. So we can therefore define our approximation to the Laplacian at a grid point ij as ui j minus 1 plus ui minus 1 j minus 4 ui j plus ui plus 1 j plus ui j plus 1 divided by h squared. And that corresponds to the five-point stencil shown here. Suppose our grid has nx points in the x direction and ny points in the y direction, then we can represent our numerical solution as a vector u of length nx times ny. And we want to then construct a differentiation matrix, d2, that will approximate our Laplacian. And we can ask ourselves how many non-zero diagonals will our matrix d2 have, and we'll look at the answer to this in a second. To construct d2, we'll need to relate the entries of the vector u to our 2D grid-based values u at i, j. Hence, we need to number the nodes from 0 to nx times ny minus 1. And what we'll do is we'll go along the first row of the grid and label those from 0 to nx minus 1, 
and we'll then go along the second row of the grid and label those from nx to 2nx minus 1 and so on. So let's script g denote the mapping from the 2D indexing to the 1D indexing. And from the above figure, we can see that script G of i, j with a grid of size nx will just be equal to j times nx plus i. Let us now focus on node i, j in our finite difference grid. And that will correspond to the entry script G of i, j in our vector u. Due to the five-point stencil, we know that the row corresponding to script G i, j will only have non-zero entries in up to five columns. And we can determine the indexes of those five columns using our script G operator on the points that neighbor i, j. And if we look at script G of i, j minus one, then we'll see that that is script G of i, j, but displaced by minus nx. Similarly, if we look at the other neighbors of i, j, we'll see that they correspond to displacements of minus 1, plus 1, and plus nx in our solution vector. Hence, if we look at the displacements of minus 1 and 0 and 1, then that will give us a tridiagonal structure that we're used to for differentiation matrices in 1D domains. But the displacements due to minus nx and nx will give us diagonals that are shifted by plus or minus nx. So if we now look at our matrix D2 for the case when nx and ny are equal to 6, then we have the following sparsity pattern. And we see that there are then five diagonals. We see certain terms are missing, and they correspond to cases when our neighbors of a grid point might be out of range of the grid. So now let's look at a Python demo where we'll solve the Poisson equation, Laplacian of u is equal to minus e to the minus x minus 0.25 squared minus y minus 0.5 squared on the unit square. And we'll impose zero Dirichlet boundary conditions on the edges of the square. Let's now take a look at the program Poisson.py that can solve the 2D Poisson equation del squared u equal f on the unit square and will make use of zero Dirichlet boundary conditions on all sides of the square and for our function f we'll use a negative Gaussian that's centered on x equal a quarter and y equal a half. And we're going to solve this equation using the finite difference method using a regular rectangular grid on our unit square. And we'll make use of an m by m grid of interior points shown in green in this diagram. And we'll pad this m by m grid with one layer on all sides of blue grid points on the boundaries of the unit square and we'll impose our zero Dirichlet boundary condition there. Since our grid overall is m plus 2 by m plus 2, then our grid spacing h will be equal to 1 divided by m plus 1. So if we look at our program, we first define m equals 16, and then we define a constant mm that's equal to m squared, that's equal to our total number of interior grid points and we then define our grid spacing h. We'll then create the derivative matrix and the source term. So our derivative matrix will be an mm by mm matrix and our source term will be an mm long vector. And we'll define a useful constant h fact to be one divided by h squared that appears in a number of the derivative matrix stencil entries. We'll then loop over all of the grid points i, j in the interior of our grid. And we'll compute the corresponding vector index i, j 
which is equal to i plus m times j. We'll then set the entries in the ijth row of the derivative matrix. So on the diagonal, we'll have a term of size minus 4 times hvac, and then we'll have up to four additional off-diagonal entries corresponding to the four orthogonal neighbors of the current grid point. If those neighbors are on the boundary corresponding to blue grid points, then since our solution is zero there, then we can just omit any contribution to the derivative matrix from those points. We'll then compute the corresponding entry of the source term vector. We'll then plot the sparsity structure of the derivative matrix and we'll then solve the linear system to find our solution u. For plotting purposes, we now construct a full representation of our solution on the m plus 2 by m plus 2 grid. So we construct a array uu that's of size m plus 2 and m plus 2, and we then copy the relevant entries of u into rows of our array uu. And we then plot the full UU array using matplotlib. So let me now go ahead and run this program. So we first see the sparsity structure of our derivative matrix. And our derivative matrix will be of size 256 by 256. And down the middle of this matrix, we see that there is this tridiagonal structure. And we have terms on the diagonal corresponding to our minus 4 times hvac entries. And then we have terms on the lower and upper diagonals corresponding to the left and right neighbors of the current grid point. And we then have two diagonals that are further away that correspond to the lower and upper neighbors of our current grid point that are displaced by a distance of m in the matrix indexing. Let's now look at our solution. And we see here that we have the zero Dirichlet conditions that are set on all sides of the square and then we have a single smooth peak in our solution and we would expect to have a smooth peak since we're setting del squared u to be equal to a negative number and therefore our solution should have negative curvature which would correspond to a peak so let's now run this program again, but we'll make use of a finer grid. So we'll increase the grid to m equal 32. We have a similar sparsity structure to before, although now our matrix is 1024 by 1024 large. And again, we see the smooth peak in our solution U, although now the resolution of this peak is improved. So it's worth noting that the numerical methods used in this example are not as efficient as they could be and we end up creating a derivative matrix that has many zero entries and currently using the numpy.linaus.solve command we are solving this linear system using methods tailored to dense linear algebra and that will become very inefficient as m grows larger.
For this type of problem, we'd be much better using a sparse matrix solver, such as a Krylov method or a multigrid method, and we'll talk about these later on in the course.